Chapter 9 of Quest of the Golden Ape by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quest of the Golden Ape. Chapter 9 In Custody. Bram Forrest regained consciousness upon a grassy slope across which slanted the rays of a setting sun. The same sun that had warmed him upon the planet Tarth, of this he was certain. He arose and glanced about quickly, realizing, while he was sure he had returned to Earth, that he could be many miles from the mysterious mansion under which he had spent one hundred years. At first his heart sank, because the terrain was not at all familiar. Then it rose again as he saw the tower of the gray mansion pushing somberly above the line of the forest top. He stood for a moment, orienting himself with the tower the center of his calculations. Then he moved out of the glade toward his right. But he had gone scarcely ten feet into the wooded area when his sharpened instincts gave him quick warning and he dropped like a stone and lay still. The sound of footsteps greatened until their echo came loud in his ears, and a man passed not ten feet from his outstretched hands. The man wore the blue uniform and smart cap of a state trooper, and he was on the alert, but not so much so as to detect the silent Bram Forrest. The latter, with the first moment he had had to give thought to himself since he had awakened in the cavern on the plains of Ofrid, realized suddenly that he was no longer naked. He had, of course, been vaguely aware of this before, but now he gave it his attention and realized what had happened. He focused on past events. During his time of unconsciousness from the treacherous Abarian's blade thrust, the beautiful Ilya had garbed him in the brilliant uniform of the slain Nadian, Zhlomek. This uniform was both colorful and practical, but it did nothing to either hide or encumber the great muscles of his chest and arms, thighs. The state trooper passed on his way, and Bram Forrest wondered what he was doing about the old mansion, but this did not occupy his thoughts for long. As soon as the way was clear, he moved like a great cat through the underbrush toward the spot from whence he had made his exodus to the planet Tarth. As he skirted the last glade, he prayed that the second article in the box containing the fabulous disc he had now switched to his right wrist still lay where he had carelessly dropped it. He came to the edge of the open field and warily surveyed the terrain. No one was in sight. He strained his ears for the sound of any approaching footsteps and heard nothing. He sprang swiftly into the open and ran across the field. It was there, the flat white package, exactly where he had dropped it that first morning. He swept it up, intent upon returning to the shelter of the forest. But his interest in what lay beneath the white paper wrapping had grown to such a point of intensity that his footsteps lagged his attention riveted upon the tantalizing thing, and he came to a full stop mid-field while his strong fingers tore at the wrappings. The white parchment came away, and Bram Forrest stared at what was revealed. Then a strange and terrifying change came over him. His handsome features contorted as every drop of blood was drained from his face. His great frame shook as with an illness, and such a demoniacal rage came over him as few people in this or any other world have seen. Now a great and terrifying cry arose from his throat, a cry that make even the beasts of this forest freeze in their tracks and crouch lower in their places of concealment, a cry of such rage and agony that even the trees of the forest seem to pause and listen in mute wonder. Mulcahy Davis, state trooper, picked brambles from the legs of his blue uniform and cursed his assignment in no uncertain terms. Why, in the name of law and decency, had he and Mowbray been ordered to patrol this tangled, deserted spook-hole? Sure, the body of some old hobo had been found in a well with rocks thrown on it, but what were he and Mowbray going to prove by tramping around through these brambles? Mulcahy Davis heard footsteps, and looked up to see Mowbray laboring across the last few yards of his beat. Mowbray broke from the last clutching strands of thornbush and began beating burrs from his legs. "'Find anything?' 
he asked. Not a blasted thing. It's downright crazy, our clambering around this woods. What will we find? A couple of rabbits? That body in the well has to be investigated, Mowbray said seriously. Pretty odd deal. What progress have they made? They've located the outfit that held this place in trust, but the guy in charge had a stroke or something. He can't be questioned. They may never be able to question him. An old guy named Pride. He's in pretty bad shape. Chances are he wouldn't know anything about it, even if they could ask him. What would he have been doing out here? There's that funny fire in the basement, too. Nothing routine about that. Fire so hot, it melted rock. A lot of unanswered questions here. If they'd ask me, I'd tell them... Mulcahy Davis' throat froze as a terrible cry smote his ears. Mowbray paled suddenly, and the two men looked at each other in instinctive fear. But they were tried and tested law enforcement officers and were not held in the grip of terror for long. Did you hear that? Mulcahy Davis said. Good Lord, man, how could I help it? Where did it come from? Over there. Let's go. The two troopers plunged again into the undergrowth to emerge at the edge of an open field. And regardless of their personal courage and experience in their line of effort, what they saw froze them anew. A giant of a man, a creature of godlike proportions, stood in the open field, washed by the rays of the setting sun. His great arms were held aloft, and he was looking up into the sky with a terrifying expression that was a mixture of pain and rage. He was speaking, and his great voice echoed in what was remindful of a thunderous prayer. I know not the purpose for which I was created, but well do I now know my dedicated task. Vengeance! Vengeance! Such as this world or any other has never seen! With this, the giant, clad in a strange, colorful uniform of some sort, dropped to his knees and lowered his great head into his hands. Mowbray's face was grim and alert. "'Come on,' he whispered. "'We're behind him, so we get a break. Move in quietly, and let's get in before he sees us. I've got a hunch he could lick ten of us, and we don't want to use our guns.' They crossed the field softly and moved in behind the kneeling man. They acted in concert with an expertness telling of lengthy experience. Mowbray was thankful for the way it turned out. He knew not why the giant put up no resistance. The man seemed stunned as from a great blow, and before he could recover the troopers had him bound hand and foot with their belts. Mulcahy Davis got to his feet and wiped the sweat from his face. There's one for the psychos and a padded cell afterwards. You said it, Mowbray agreed heartily. Let's take him in. End of chapter 9